on this episode of China Unscripted, our trip to the 2019 Oslo Freedom Forum, the socialist model of Star Trek. And 30 years after the Tiananmen Square Massacre, what's the future of China? Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we're recording this in Oslo, Norway, after having just been to the Oslo Freedom Forum. Why don't you say what that is, Shelley? Well, I guess it is the Davos of uh, human rights. And what is the Davos? Chris, you don't know what Davos is? I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate for those who don't know. Okay, so let's say it's a conference where human rights activists from around the world come and uh, meet each other and talk and um, listen to speeches about different human rights situations in other countries and um, all the activists are there kind of fighting for freedom and against tyranny and authoritarianism in their own ways. And while that may sound potentially horribly depressing, and it kind of is at times, it's actually a very uplifting uh, conference, I find. There's also a number of celebrities. I mean, Me? one of the people you, uh, Chris Chappell, yeah. obviously. Um, and, way to jump in there. And, you know. and Shelley Jong. Uh, uh, there's no way that I'm a celebrity, but keep going. Uh, but, you know, one of the people you interviewed was Denise Ho, who's a pretty famous canto pop singer. Yeah, she was fantastic, super friendly. And she was, like, really famous in Asia. And then uh, when the Hong Kong umbrella movement happened, she supported the students and she got political yeah how dare she support freedom and she basically got banned from performing in china and you know Her she, social media accounts in china were deleted yeah and i think in a lot of ways she accidentally became a dissident like it wasn't that she wanted to become a dissident it's just that that she was just doing what she thought was right and then the chinese communist party was like you can't do that and so, but she's she's very well known. In the past, you've interviewed uh, Mai Khoi, who's like the Lady Gaga of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's some pretty well known people at the Oslo Freedom Forum. We did we did a lot of interviews actually. Um, and for those of you listening, if you're watching China Uncensored, over the next few weeks, we'll release some of the interviews we did on our channel, China Uncensored. Uh, people like a. Uh, activists from Nicaragua or from Cameroon, people who talk about how the Chinese Communist Party is propping up the authoritarian regime in their countries. Uh, we also talked to a reporter from Burma slash Myanmar, depending on how you know that country, uh, about uh, you know how China is had been a big influence there for years, and uh, also pretty interesting. I think is we've interviewed our first. Um, former ambassador of North Korea. First, but hopefully not the last. Uh, yes, uh, we interviewed Ambassador Tae Young Ho, who was the deputy ambassador in London for North Korea, and then he defected in 2016, and he's become a pretty outspoken, uh, I guess, voice against. A critic, would you call it? You know, I'd say so. And uh, he, you know, was it, at this event, there have been people who have been targeted, let's say, by some authoritarian regimes. Attempted assassinations, would you say? Yes, we've met one oh, of... Oh, yeah, the other night we met that Russian uh, dissident who has, was poisoned not once but twice by Putin's henchmen. Yes, Vladimir Karamaza. Something like that. And, my Russian isn't and, great. Yes, my Russian is terrible. But I think uh, he's, you know, that's not made him be less outspoken at all. Yeah. Um, but also um, the Nicaraguan activist we interviewed. Yeah. Actually, it reminds me of just how much security there was at this event. There were, there were definitely bodyguards everywhere, particularly for the North Korean ambassador, former North Korean ambassador. In fact, at one point, like after he gave a speech, so this is the guy who lives his life 
needing to constantly be taking precautions against getting assassinated. He's like he might be like number one on the on Kim Jong Un's hit list. And so, well, now that his brother's dead. Now yeah. his brother is dead. Uh, yeah, he's moved up the list. Yeah, wow. Uh, but yeah, one day after he gave a speech, he like walked outside and like this Norwegian guy threw a milkshake at him. Yeah, I think it was that he had given a pretty prominent interview to one of the largest newspapers in Norway, mm-hmm. and so people had read that would know that he was at the Oslo Freedom Forum, and um, some guy came and threw a milkshake. Like, why a milkshake? Oh, I think it's because of the Nigel Farage thing. Wait, what's that? Nigel Farage, the Brexit guy. Yeah. Somebody threw a milkshake at him. And so this was an act of imitating that. Well, I can't imagine that it was like two people independently thought the best means of political protest was throwing a milkshake on a person. It's weird. I mean, it seems like a waste of a perfectly good milkshake. Mm, Unless, Unless it was one of those really lousy milkshakes we got at that burger place the other night, Max. Okay. I would throw one of those. You you have just on air threatened to throw a bad milkshake at. The no, I didn't. I didn't specify the target. I just said I might throw one in the might. trash. In, in the trash is what I meant specifically. I'm also reminded of uh, there's this video of George W. Bush speaking, and someone throws a shoe at Bush. Oh right, I then, forgot. And about then the he shoe ducks. And then the guy throws his other shoe, and Bush ducks in that one. And then the security guards come and tackle the guy. All right. Yeah, I feel like this was kind of before... Was this prior to YouTube, or like in the early days of YouTube? It was kind of at a time when like, it kind of got famous, but, you know... How do people watch videos online? Well, remember, so, so... Who remembers Real Player? Oh, oh man. Yeah. So back in the day when I first started doing television reporting, uh, our channel would upload videos to Real Player, like dot RM, and the quality was so bad, but it seemed like it was the coolest thing ever to actually get your your broadcast content on the internet. Well, I mean I remember what YouTube videos looked like in the beginning and they were trash. Like, yeah, like moving P. pixels. Yeah. You know, who's that spoke. So it didn't really seem at the time that this was going to be like the predominant medium for video. The and, number two search engine in the world. And, you know, what we would then build our careers on. Yes, yes, that, that did come as a surprise, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. I feel like we got a little off topic now. So we're talking about the, <laughs> the, the interview with... Tae Young Ho, which is the North Korean ambassador who uh, defected from uh, his post as a North Korean ambassador. Deputy. Deputy. And uh, boy, did he have some interesting stuff to say about North Korea. Yeah. Uh, I think I think people will like that interview. And speaking of North Korea, we also had a chance to interview uh, Robert Kelly... And more uh, famously known as R. Kelly. No, no, we're, we're not. No, no, <laughs> different no. person. Uh, it was difficult to uh, do some research on him because if you type Robert Kelly, you get R. Kelly first. So Robert Kelly is more famously known as Shelley. <laughs> Let's not talk about R. Kelly anymore for obvious reasons. Is that what's happening now? What are obvious reasons? You don't know about how he had forced sex with underage girls. Yeah, I okay. know about that. Then he keep him in the basement or something. All right. Uh, so this uh, this other guy we interviewed, who is not R. Kelly, more famously known as BBC Dad. Yeah, it's the guy who was who's an expert uh, and a professor uh, who talks about South Korea and North Korea, and uh, his beautiful family interrupted his live interview with the BBC. Uh, but he came on our podcast, which will actually be the next podcast out next week. That's correct. That's correct. And that'll be the first one that we uh, have ever videoed, videotaped. Uh, and uh, so you can watch that on our YouTube channel or listen to it on our other platforms. I had no idea what to do with my hands. Yeah, it was a bit weird doing it on video. Yeah. But also the Oslo Freedom Forum gave us a room to do our interviews and 
stuff. So it was it was really, firstly, very awesome of the Freedom Forum to arrange that. Yeah, they've been super supportive. And actually, if you want to know more about the Oslo Freedom Forum, I would recommend checking out Shelley's Twitter account because she live tweeted the whole thing. Wow, well, the whole thing. Not the, it was uh, the whole thing. It was it was insane the things she was doing. I do have to say that I was pretty exhausted. I mean, for me, it was kind of like taking notes in public in a way because it helps me focus on what they're saying and all this stuff. But uh, and not like let my mind wander, but it was pretty intense. Uh, it's it's always a great um, kind of experience in that I think we talked about this last year on our podcast, uh, where it feels great and terrible at the same time because um, there are these people doing these these inspiring things, but then you realize how much of the world is under authoritarianism. And you're like, oh, don't you have a president? Well, he's more of a dictator. Oh, you have a king. Well, the, he's more of a dictator. <laughs> yeah. But Shelly, what's your Twitter account so people can go Oh, yeah, it's uh, at Sheljong. So it's at S-H-E-L-Z-H-A-N-G. Yeah. But, you know, speaking of, uh, yeah, I think the Oslo Freedom Forum did a good job of really painting the picture of just like how much authoritarianism there still is in the world today. And in particular, they made a focus of focusing on. They made a focus of focusing on. We're a little, very jet lagged. You need to focus, Chris. We're not jet lagged anymore. I think we're just exhausted. Well, no, we were jet lagged and then didn't rest. So, what what do you get when you add exhaustion on top of jet lag? Well, I don't freedom. The best are you still podcast wake- ever. Are you still waking up at three a.m.? I mean, it's, I think we've transitioned over. The, it's the just sun that, rises at three a.m. That's true. That's true. Uh, but. You know that they were saying at the Freedom Forum that 53% of the world's people live under authoritarian regimes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you're living in a free country, you are in the minority. Um, but Indeed. you were saying that there was a specific focus. Uh, Which was China. They really focused a lot on China as the world's uh, largest authoritarian regime. Yeah, and to be fair, for the last, this is the 11th year they've done it, and Ever since they started in 2008, they have talked about China There's as been being a least... serious threat. So, like, you know, the, it's not like suddenly they're talking about China. But the difference is this year, it was like right in the beginning, they had uh, Denise Ho, the Hong Kong canto pop singer. Actually, first. And they had, the yeah. first one was Nuri Turkel, Turkel, who we had interviewed on uh, China Uncensored and also on our podcast back last summer. Well, uh, when we went down to D.C. If people are looking for those episodes, it was actually, I think, in September or October that we published them. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, so we, so we had him on, and then he... Uh, He's a leader of the uh, like Uyghurs, part yeah. of the Uyghur diaspora. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's really done a great job of articulating just what the Uyghurs in China are facing. And just to have him and also the, then Denise Ho up front in the Oslo Freedom Forum really spoke... To, I think the the guts that the the people running the Oslo Freedom Forum have, in terms of standing up to the Chinese Communist Party, because even some human rights organizations are a little bit hesitant about really calling out the Chinese Communist Party. But Oslo Freedom Forum is like, yeah, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right in the beginning. I think also what's interesting about the Oslo Freedom Forum is their emphasis is on, uh, you know, promoting freedom and fighting authoritarianism around the world so that is a big umbrella in a lot of ways so it's like a big tent you have people from all different working on all different things from like child brides in malawi to you know women's rights in saudi arabia to you know uh like these um like doping in russia oh right there was that um the director of Of icarus the um netflix documentary that's won about an Academy that award yeah it won an academy award about that crazy russian doping scandal which chris you and i were talking and we realized that we completely, completely missed, the, missed it we missed the story because we focus on china so, so much. much uh so but i i i am now after hearing about um that whole crazy story of how the russian um got like head of the russian anti-doping lab who uh, the director had helped 
trying to flee Russia uh, and had brought with him all of this uh, evidence about how Russia had been doping for decades. Basically the entire time. Yes, and then it was just much bigger than anybody had ever thought before, and now he lives in like 24-7, under 24-7 yeah. sort of security because there's the very real threat that he could be yeah. killed at any time. Not the director of the movie, but the guy he interviewed who was the head of the... Yes, the Russian... The head uh, of the Russian lab that was doing the yes. testing. Um, so yeah, so like a lot of countries, uh, there was a guy who presented who's from Tajikistan, which is one of those landlocked stands that borders China. And, and also Afghanistan. And also Afghanistan. And... Yeah, his story was he was an activist, but he was in Moscow, and the Tajikistan authorities worked with the Russian authorities to kidnap him. They put a bag over his head, put him on a private plane, and flew him uh, to Tajikistan, where they then threw him in prison. Like, that's a crazy coordination between dictators. You know, all this kind of Russia talk is making me think that maybe Russia Uncensored is not... A great idea. Uh, well, also besides the fact that we couldn't possibly handle any more work than we do. But yeah, and also... Um, also, we don't know enough about Russia. No, oh, well, that's it. true. The but... um, oh, God, Bill Browder. Oh, yes, totally. Who created the Magnitsky Act. Well, Magnitsky. Magnitsky. How do you say that? Magnitsky. Magnitsky. It's Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act. And, uh, well, the story is that his law firm had this accountant, Sergei Magnitsky, Mag, oh my God, now it's happening to me. Uh, it's so hard to say Russian. I can only do fake Russian accents. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please, Shelley, continue. Uh, so, um, the Icarus director did have a pretty good re- fake Russian accent. It was so much better than mine. Yes. And I spent years with this Russian guy. Uh, and... So Sergei Magnitsky was a accountant uh, who tried to blow the whistle on the uh, corruption and things going on within the Russian oligarchy and governments and companies, and then was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And then Bill Browder decided that, uh, and Magnitsky had worked with Bill Browder's law firm. So Bill Browder, who was a... Um, He's a hedge fund guy. He's a hedge fund guy. He's a finance guy. Uh, and not a, uh, you know, not a, like a diplomat or a uh, government official, like a private citizen who then made it his kind of personal um, crusade to try to get some kind of justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And the idea kind of behind what he did was very interesting because I'm sure as you're listening, no, there's like the U.S. put sanctions on countries uh and people sometimes criticize sanctions because it just makes the country kind of poor and hurts the people of the country because the dictators just take all of the money and then the people are left to starve uh the idea behind the magnitsky act is it's sort of like targeted sanctions on individuals uh the idea being that a lot of these like well using the case of russia these russian oligarchs will like send their kids to study in universities in Europe or the U.S. or have bank accounts in, in Switzerland, Sweden, Switzerland uh, you know, do traveling there themselves, you know, really enjoy the life. And the idea behind this act is that, no, these, these sanctions, quote-unquote, target these individuals. Their bank accounts get frozen. Their kids can't go to colleges. It's a way to really directly, surgically target these people who are the ones actually committing, uh, in many cases, crimes against humanity. Yeah, so the U.S. has been one of the countries who's actually passed uh, Magnitsky Act. After so, some difficulty, too. Yes. It was not an easy thing for Bill Browder to get done. I mean, I think this is a process that takes years and a lot of tenacity. But they, the U.S. has two versions. One that's kind of Russia-specific, that's sanctioning specific uh, Russian oligarchs and officials. And then the second one... Um, that got passed later is called the Global Magnitsky Act, which is the one that basically allows for um, the U.S. government to call out, theoretically, officials from anywhere around the world. The only problem I have with with the uh, Global 
I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh-huh. Shelly, you know me too well. <laughs> I see this coming. <laughs> okay, but for those listeners who don't know where you're going with this, please, Chris, continue. Well, you know what? I think I think the listeners who really know me, they'll know where it's going. So I don't, I don't even feel I need to complete the thought. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. I um, thought that we'd, like... We'll have to keep a tally of whether we managed to get through any podcast without touching on that topic. Did we? Did, does this count as touching on? I never said it. That's but you made so. people think it in their minds, which is arguably worse. That's true. It's, that's how I like to make really bad puns. Is I'll just say, like the, the all of it except for the the final pun part of it, and then make people pun in their heads. And then they they're complicit, and they. Don't like that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but... Oh, but the, I, I remember how we got to Bill Browder because he's, uh, because we were talking about the guy from Tajikistan who had this whole, he ended up in detention because of this whole coordinated thing between the Russian government and uh, the Tajikistan government. Bill Browder, he went, like after the Magnitsky Act had been passed in the U.S. and a couple other places, he was in a trip in Madrid, Spain. And oh, then one yes. morning, knock, knock, knock on the door, hey, it's the Spanish police Apparently, Russian Interpol had put out a warrant for him, so they took him, uh, they were going to take him down to the police station, but he had a chance to uh, quickly send out a tweet, you know, being arrested, uh, help or something, and then he, and he, like, they didn't confiscate his phone, so he took a picture of, like, writing inside the back of the police car. So this went viral, and, and, you know, by the time he got to the police station... Uh, Interpol proper had like said release him yeah I think he said it took about an hour and then he was released and I think but the sca- I, was, I was about to interrupt you go ahead uh, well the interesting thing about that was that he's had at least three Interpol notices put on him oh I, I missed that part I think he might have been talking about that in, during another panel but the it, it is kind of funny that uh, you know, Interpol is uh, <laughs> the international police, but it can be abused like that. By Russia. And yeah. if he hadn't been a, you know, pretty prominent person mm-hmm. who had, like, a very large public profile, that could yeah. have gone very differently. And that's that's one thing I definitely learned in, through the Oslo Freedom Forum is that uh, being high profile is the best way to stay safe if you're in any kind of dissident. And that's why a lot of authoritarian regimes tell dissidents, oh, you know, if you keep quiet, you know, such and such, or they tell the families of the dissidents, if you keep quiet, well, things, will, know, go things will go better for your relative. But that is a lie, nine times out of ten. Yeah, because then they're just not pressured to do anything. Right. Yeah, I mean, of course, people are scared, you know, people are trying to make the best decisions. They, they, they want to keep their loved ones safe. But, um, yeah, nine out of ten times, yeah. like, being quiet won't get them released. Yeah. The, yeah. The thing about Interpol, though, also made me think about, like, the potential risk of having international uh, organizations with an enforcement mechanism. Because, okay, so there was another panel where there was some guy in the audience who asked a question. Oh, there was um, a panel that discussed how it's difficult sometimes to uh, sue a company uh, for committing some sort of crime against humanity, such as involved in slave labor, slave labor uh, because there's jurisdiction issues, right? You can't always go after them because the crime was committed in a different jurisdiction. And one audience member was like, well, wouldn't it be great if we just didn't have borders? And I, I was really thinking about this a lot, about how, you know, if 53% of the world lives under authoritarian regimes and you eliminate borders, like, what would be the average of that? The average would be authoritarian. And if you had a global um, sort of enforcement mechanism, then, like, other people, like, everyone is kind of more at risk. Um, you you would you wouldn't even have like a safe haven you could flee to like a free country. Well, I mean, I think like eliminating borders and having like a world government are two different ideas. Yeah, no, they they, they are, but they're related, 
And I think it was just the Interpol thing kind of made me start thinking about this issue of like, if you have an international police with international jurisdiction, then you're not safe even in a free country. Like Spain is a, a pretty much a free country, right? Don't a, ta- ask the Catalonians that question. Yeah, yeah. no, and, that, and that's a fair point. Um, but, you know, essentially it's a, it's a relatively free country, okay? Yes. Uh, certainly compared to most of the world. And then the idea that Interpol, you know, can, can go after some guy because an authoritarian regime connected with Interpol can send that out that notice. Like, that's a very scary thing. Yeah, I think what you kind of ends up happening is either you have like international organizations that have no enforcement mechanism like the UN, UN. or you have the risk for abuses like the, the Interpol thing that you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is there isn't a perfect solution because, you know, what would it be ideal, I guess, is to have some way for free countries to put pressure on more authoritarian countries to treat people better. But that's just, it's a very hard thing to legislate and the risk of that is is quite high as well. So I, I wouldn't even know how to begin going about setting that up in a way that is functional. Well, what I was thinking about was kind of when you were talking about in the beginning of the Oslo Freedom Forum, how they like emphasized China and um, the first thing that the the head of the Oslo Freedom Forum said was doing in his speech was he he basically called China uh, the world's largest tyranny, and had on behind him on this giant screen was like a close up picture of Tiananmen Square, like Mao's portrait in Tiananmen Square with that a security camera in front of it. Um, so, you know. The idea that in a lot of these cases you are dealing with more than one authoritarian regime together, and it's hard to talk about these some of these things as if they are unrelated. Mm-hmm. Like um, if you talk about keeping dictators in power, the Chinese Communist Party is involved in many more countries than I think any of us ever thought. Uh, when we we started doing the show, right? Yeah, basically, we can talk to just about any activist with the Oslo Freedom Forum, and somewhere there'll be China's involvement. Uh, but since you since you mentioned Tiananmen Square, I think it's uh, important to remember that this is also the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. And in fact, while we were at the Oslo Freedom Forum, we met uh, uh, somebody who was there, uh, Yang Jian Li, correct? Yes. Correct. I- I do want to go back to one thing about the the kind of China or the Chinese Communist Party being part of the this um, larger authoritarianism, which is that so to deal with this, like you really do have to deal with China. Mm. You really have to do, and that would take a what you were talking about, Matt, kind of like a more coordinated response among liberal democracies. Like nobody can really face off against. The Chinese Communist Party, or uh, alone. Yeah, no, it, and it takes you know, uh, it takes a lot of coordination, especially because it's so easy for the Communist Party to pick off individual countries one by one, which they've been doing uh, in Eastern Europe and trying to do with Western Europe. And by pick off, you mean invest heavily and get the governments of those countries yeah. on China's side. I mean, I mean. The problem is that when your two economies are intertwined, if your economy is intertwined with China's economy, it feels very risky to stand up for human rights and stand against tyranny. I mean, even Norway, the home of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, you know, had the whole thing with uh, China not buying salmon after the uh, Nobel Prize was given to Liu Xiaobo. That was back in, like, what, 2011? Yeah, and then it took years for the Norwegian government to repair that relationship. Yeah, they, were, they basically kind of crawled back on their hands and knees and be like, please, take our salmon. <laughs> I thought you were going to do, like, a take my wife, please joke, but with salmon. <laughs> how, how would that have worked, Shelley? I don't know. 
I mean, that smells a little fishy. Um, <laughs> actually, real quick while it's in my mind, before we go back to Tiananmen Square, one thing I found, I learned that was very interesting is, uh, how was it phrased? What did John Lennon, how did John Lennon describe the song Imagine? Oh yeah, because someone was playing the song Imagine. During the Oslo Freedom Forum. And yes. that's kind of taken as like, oh, this, you know, song about peace and love and understanding. How did he describe it? Oh, he said basically it's the communist manifesto. I Boom. mean, I got this from a, a Rolling Stone article. So I don't believe that they were interviewing John Lennon, but it was kind of, it was an article that was from 2001 that was called Imagine. Uh, colon the anthem of 2001 because I guess it got played a lot after the 9-11 attacks so then Rolling Stone did this article where they were interviewing a lot of musicians uh, famous musicians about what imagine means to them and then pointed out that John Lennon described it as quote virtually the communist manifesto even though I'm not particularly communist and do not belong to any movement but because it is sugar-coated it is accepted yeah, and really a lot of the ideas in that song are, yeah, straight out of communism. Imagine no possessions, yeah, imagine no, pos- no religion. No heaven, no hell. No, no heaven. Nothing to live or die for. And I think, like, on the one hand, like, this is basically taking all of the, you know, beautiful dreams and wishes of communism, of, like, this, this communist utopia that, you know, people buy into. Uh, but if you if you really think like if you have nothing to fight for, like what is the meaning, you know, uh, of life? Of, yeah, like that's an interesting way to phrase the meaning of life. But I like I get what you mean that there are there are things in life that you should be passionate and care about. Uh, that such as defending human rights, that you would be willing to fight for those. Although we, and I think the Oslo Freedom Forum generally advocates nonviolent resistance that's that's something i found very fascinating like that there are people in the world who have actually like figured out strategies for how activists can topple authoritarian regimes and specifically they they like they've done the research and they found that nonviolent tactics is the best way to topple an authoritarian regime and lead to uh, a democracy in fact something like only four percent of violent revolutions ever ends up creating democracy. What was the nonviolent uh, statistic? Twenty six percent. No, 40%. I think it was higher. I I also think it's higher, but you guys talk while I find the statistic. Okay. But at any rate, my point is like, you know, okay, or or like no possessions. It's kind of like so oh. I was having talking about something very nice, and then you just you just went back to what you were saying. But that's what I do. I know. Um, because we're talking about the song Imagine, right? And, 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 like, it is a... Musically, it's a very beautiful song. But, like, okay, no possessions. Like, oh, you know, we shouldn't be so materialistic. And that's actually something I agree with. But the idea that no one has possessions, it's like you have no... It, it's basically like you have no rights. And if you have no possessions, you, it's like you don't have the rights to the fruits of your own labor. Yeah, there's a lot of things that has to happen for no possessions to actually happen. Like Star Trek? Oh, Star Trek. Well, no, people, I think people have possessions in Star Trek. Well, what you told me today that I had no idea was that there's no money in Star Trek. Yeah, it's, it's the actual politics of Star Trek are very ill-defined, but it's definitely like some kind of weird socialism where, yeah, there's, there's no money and people, they, they just work whatever jobs they want to better themselves. And there's so like you're saying that resources. Star Trek has universal basic income? Uh, well, I don't think it's even that because they they have no money to pay for anything. Like, it's really unclear how resources and jobs are distributed. I bet somebody has done some kind of deep analysis Probably. about this on the internet. Well, and also at the end of the day, what Star Trek is about is essentially race wars for resources. Are we just going to ruin all the things for people today? Like, we're just going to ruin the song Imagine. Yeah. If you, It's all communism. Communists are everywhere. <laughs> uh, we're going to ruin the song Imagine. And then, like, if you set it to a more... I don't know, what, heavy metal or something? It's going to sound like 
like pretty hardcore and what uh, oh if you if you instead of like the lovely piano ballad you just like imagine no possession <laughs> imagine no heaven and <laughs> yes exactly it has a very different sound right it's not <laughs> yeah. so nice anymore um but i did find okay and then we're also going to ruin star trek yeah star trek i thought you liked star trek i do I like Jean-Luc Picard, the most British Frenchman <laughs> in the history of the universe. Were you the one telling me that he was supposed to be French in the beginning? Or did I read that somewhere? Uh, I, I think it's just one of those things that's mentioned, because his name is Jean-Luc Picard. Uh-huh. <laughs> but and Q always plays that. I'd be like, Jean-Luc. <laughs> and it's like, he's very British. Okay, so I found the statistic... Oh. That we were talking about five topics ago. Okay. Nonviolent campaigns are ten times more likely to end in durable democracies. So for violent campaigns, that means 4%. Nonviolent, 41%. Yeah. Um, and so this is interesting. There are organizations that train people in different nonviolent tactics, which, you know, there's sometimes this idea that nonviolence, oh, it's, you know, frou-frou, ha-ha, everybody hugs, everybody plays, gets together and sings Imagine. But no, these are like actual... <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, like, no, these are like actual functional tactics to overthrow regimes. And it's strategic and not just because people don't like guns or yeah. something. Yeah. Like, like an example that was given is like in Syria where, you know, for like seven months or something, people had like this nonviolent uh, movement. And then at some point decided, hey, we should form an army and fight Assad. And it's like... You, you went from attacking Assad where he was weak to attacking him where he was really strong. Like, it, like China would be a good example. Like, you're, the average Chinese person is not going to be able to match the military might of the Chinese Communist Party. But... Well, Matt, I think you had an interesting point about this related to America, right? Oh, well, that only 4% of violent resistance movements lead to democracies. And that 4% is probably comprised largely of the United States. I mean, we did fight a violent revolution against the British Woo! and, and succeed. This is, this is the basis of American exceptionalism, which, which I'm not saying I agree with, but in this particular case, you know, there, there is a non-zero percentage of the time that things that don't normally work can work. Right. And I think but there's a lot of factors like the American Revolution did not succeed because of its violence. It succeeded for a variety of factors uh, The you know, there was assistance from the French mm -hmm. and there was the British had their own you know issues they were dealing with Mel at the Gibson. time. And also, yeah. And also the, the British rulers were were on the another Patriot. continent. Shelley. OK, I thought you were talking about what's the Scotsman movie? Braveheart. Peter Hare's Guide to the Galaxy? No. <laughs> Braveheart. Braveheart. I, Braveheart. Thought, I thought you were talking about Braveheart. And he so... liberated all kinds of <laughs> And so I was very confused. <laughs> Until he was liberated of his insides. What? He's talking about Braveheart. Again. Braveheart. I thought he got decapitated. I'm pretty no, sure that was not what happened. No, it was much more gruesome than that. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, he always had guts. <laughs> Not by the end. So at any, at any rate, yeah. So yes, Amer America is an exception to that, but it's it's not a good lesson to learn. And also, times are different now in the sense of if you have a large number of peaceful protesters in 2019 that are mowed down by armed troops, you know the social media impact of this the the degree to which the rest of the world is going to come together and say, you know, that this was wrong, we support the nonviolent resistance movement, you know, it's essentially is a, is a thing that will help the resistance movement. Um, and this actually kind of ties into the how strategic this needs to be, because, right. uh, like, there was, a, there was a speech given by... Um, uh, Sergei Popovich. Sergei. Ser Sergei. Sergei Popovich. It, it's hard to, to pronounce his name because it, it's like S R D J A. It's There's only one vowel. consonants, no vowels. Yeah. But yeah, so I use the example of like uh, the Umbrella Movement as an example of something that was not 
super strategic. Like they had a big show of force, like getting onto the streets, peaceful protests, but they had no plan for what happens if the Communist Party ignores you. Then your movement just kind of peters out and you don't have anywhere to go. I think he was also t- talking about how occupation is one of the worst like, yeah. uh, tactics. <laughs> because it drains you. You can't go anywhere from it. He also mentioned how difficult it is for uh, even successful nonviolent movements. A lot of them fall apart after they win. I, I do think right. that like was Egypt one... Egypt is a good example of that. Yeah. 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 I think that was an interesting... One of the most interesting um, panels we went to, and it was like 10 minutes long, uh, mm-hmm. on why movements fail. Because I had no idea that most movements fail in the victory stage. Right. I mean, like, you see what's happening in Venezuela, and there's now this kind of, you know, most democracies are supporting the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, but... There's a question is, even if he's able to oust Nicolas Maduro, will Juan Guaido's National Assembly be able to form a functioning government and solve the enormous problems that the people there face uh, in a short enough period of time that they will continue to get the support uh, that allows them to endure? And yeah. if they don't do that, then there could easily be a, a coup from... The Maduro's people or some sort of deep state. Yeah. Well, because it's also easy for like a bunch of people to unite against a common enemy. Once that common enemy is gone, well, then you, people aren't united and they have all these different viewpoints, different desires, different ways to build the government, and that's where things fall apart. It's really like Star Wars. You had the Rebel Alliance fighting the Empire, and once they win, well, then they form a kind of non functional new republic that is divided and then a first order comes along and blows up a few planets and the whole thing falls apart we're talking about the most recent movies now yeah well right if you look at like six i'm sorry so seven uh takes place like what 30 years after episode six something like that and like in that time you see that you know the rebel alliance like they they took down you know darth vader and and uh palpatine but they're like, eh, they're not really like I becoming thought, a functioning that's, that's galactic government. Okay. Government. Yeah. I thought that just meant that they hadn't, like, managed to win everywhere, that there was still... I guess, in a way, there was still, like, uh, outer reach. But it's. I think there's still, like, a lot of, like, that the New Republic didn't actually function super well. Uh Wait, is is Star Wars just, like, political science in space? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, yes. There's, like, history books about it don't you know about the infinity wars shall i no no the infinite wars I'm confused <laughs> the Marvel. infinity war is something yeah. different the hyperspace wars. i haven't watched it yet so don't say yeah. anything about it. also i have a feeling that there's going to be at least one person who listens to this who's upset because in one single podcast we're mixing star trek and star wars now you can talk about them in the same podcast. That's fine. Especially when you point out that Star Wars is just so much better. Actually, that's not my opinion necessarily. I was going to say, I thought you liked Star Trek. Before. Yeah. No, so, I don't so, know. So I'm this, back and forth. This is the part of the, of the discussion that we don't want to get into. Well, because like, it will be the most contentious too thing. Too controversial. I know. Yes, too, con- yeah. too much conflict. Whoa, guys. Like, I'm all for calling out authoritarian regimes, but this is an issue I do not want to Look, wade into. Star Trek is Star Wars from the perspective of the empire there we have it and the empire is socialist <laughs> fyi i feel like you're slowly talking but, yourself out of liking it's, star it's, trek it's, it's, it's some sort of like national socialist party i oh. basically is in a cut scene of a new hope like there is a whole discussion about how like the empire is nationalizing a bunch of industries wait now that. you switched to star wars i have switched to star wars i was talking about star trek oh you did Right, because Star in Star Trek, it's it's like this, you know, national socialist. What? Type How, thing, right? Are, like, are you calling Star Trek Nazis? Uh, I mean, like, I'd say the Empire is much closer to the Nazis than yes. at least how we're presented with the Federation. However, the Federation still is going to like random planets and killing off the alien species right. to get their... But are, aren't they the supposed whole, to... The whole thing is like, like what is, not isn't the prime to... directive like, oh, you're not supposed to do that and stuff? And they're always violating that. Every episode is about <laughs> like is. going to a planet and like, well, should we follow the prime directive? No! no. <laughs> In this instance, let's not. <laughs> but let's and not then, do this again. Don't tell anyone. And then Captain Kirk kisses an alien woman. 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now thinking mainly of Next okay. Generation. Um, but yeah, it's just like a super-powered military organization that like has more firepower than anyone else. It goes around and forces their will. But they also think they're the good guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Darth Vader probably thought he was the good guy. Well, maybe not since he like mowed down all those children with his light sword. That's what it's called, the light sword. That's it doesn't weigh angry, very much. angry comments. No, I think Lucas, George Lucas calls it like a light sword. Like he gets it wrong. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, that doesn't mean that people can't be mad at somebody just because they created the thing in the first place. That happens all the time. I mean, I'm, people are mad at George Lucas, like, for all the things he did to Star Wars. I am afterwards. going to say that I wish he had made the new trilogy. I think he had a good idea for it, and I'm sorry he didn't get to make it. Do I want to know what it is? Uh, maybe. I mean, like, basically, he was going to double down on the midi chlorian or midi chlorin idea. That, like, the Force is, like, created by, like, all these microscopic beings that are kind of manipulating the whole galaxy. So we're going to zoom in to a person's body. And yeah. Then, like, will... it, it's going to be, the, the like, the conflict between the midichlorians. Well, I don't know how it would, <laughs> it would have played out. But, yeah, he said he was going to take it to the microscopic level. And, exactly. like, it raises a lot of interesting questions. Like, if everything is being manipulated by, like, these microscopic entities, like... What does that mean for everything we've seen so far? What 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 is the creation of the chosen one? What is the fall of Darth Vader? Was that being was his fall being manipulated by like these these horrible entities that we have no control over? I, what I'm How hearing, do you fight these entities? What I'm hearing is Star Wars Osmosis Jones. Exactly. <laughs> I'm kind of glad he took the four billion dollars from Disney. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, because the new trilogies are so much more interesting than microscopic battles. Microscopic I don't know. Do space the little battles. microscopic things have light swords? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't know, and that's, that's the interesting thing. How do you fight an enemy that is microscopic? How do you fight the enemy within? Yeah. Oh, my God, now it's a philosophical message. Star Wars always was philosophical. Oh. The hero's journey, shall we? Oh, right. The, the space dark monks. father. Space monks. Space monks. Space wizards. They're space wizards. Who happen to just be a, like a, like a chaste religious order? Something like that. I remember, what's his face? Who played Obi-Wan in the original trilogy? Sir Alec Guinness or something. Mm. Yeah, like, like in interviews, he was like, oh, I always wanted to play a wizard. <laughs> like he he played he he just played it as a wizard, which is basically what they are, evil that, space wizards. That seems to be putting a, a nicer spin on it, you know. <laughs> a nicer spin than what? Than being like, I don't want to pay, play your space wizard because he was a, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very accomplished. Yes. Well, it's like uh, Patrick Stewart playing Jean Luc Picard. Most Next Generation episodes are very bad. <laughs> Like, I, I've been re-watching it, and most of them are terrible. So out of, like, a season of, like, 24 episodes, how many are good on um, average? Well, the first couple of seasons are pretty rough. Um, I'm still working my way through. So maybe, like, the later seasons, they kind of get it more. But, like, one of the first episodes of Next Generation is they go to a planet of black people who have this weird tribal culture and the king of this planet... Uh, becomes infatuated with like the white security lady on the Enterprise and so he wants to have his current wife fight her to the death and the winner will get to be his uh, queen. Okay. And it's just off. Apparently the guy who wrote that script eventually got fired for being like a big racist jerk. But like this is like one of the first episodes. It's amazing this show survived. Wow. If Twitter had existed back then, it probably would have been canceled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Wow. Um, you know, eventually the Borg show up and then it's good. But the thing is, uh, Patrick Stewart, he's always giving a, like 110% mm-hmm. to everything, even in like the stupidest things. Like where for some reason he's like playing a 1940s style film noir detective. I mean, we can't really criticize Star Trek for doing that, being what we did in Australia. 
Hey, we can because no one watched that episode, so nobody knows <laughs> that exists. One episode that we filmed in Australia. What? What weird noir thing? Oh uh, yeah. yeah, in Chinatown. <laughs> Forget it. It's Chinatown. Yeah. Somebody was telling me at the Oslo Freedom Forum that like the forget it, it's Chinatown thing just is like forget it, it's Chinatown is just like about everything the Communist Party does that because like it's like forget it, it's China like you know yeah it's Chinatown nothing not, the world's chaos you can't no rhyme or reason mm. imagine oh uh, cool. so what were we talking about before we got sidetracked Tiananmen Square <laughs> yeah so so it's the thirtieth anniversary of. The Tiananmen Square Massacre, Um, or as Encyclopedia Britannica now calls it, the Tiananmen Square Incident. Does it? Yeah. Didn't you read the script, Shelley? Not not the script for this podcast, because this is China scripted, but uh, we did an episode. Oh! I uh, wasn't there. You weren't there? Oh yeah, you didn't watch it. Yeah, remember when you were in East Germany, and then you weren't editing scripts? Yeah. So, depending on if this podcast actually comes out on June 4th, which is the plan, yesterday we will have released an interview on China Uncensored with Zhou Feng Suo, a survivor of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. He's a student leader. And in that episode, we make the point that um, kind of the West has kind of stopped talking about uh, the Tiananmen Square Massacre in the same way. And yes, Shelley, the Encyclopedia Britannica now no longer calls it the Tiananmen Square Massacre. They call it the Tiananmen Square Incident. Because it's just mm. an incident. Really? Right? Just an incident? Some oh, things yeah. happen to some people. Who said that? Some things happen. It was a thing where some things... Oh, no, this is a Ilhar Oman thing when she commented on oh, about September 11th. Let's not go there. We're not going to go there. Up. Backing up. <laughs> 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 I also don't know what this is about. So, but, but look, it, it it's just symptomatic of how a lot of Western companies they don't want to get political, and in order to avoid getting political, Let's they have get to political. But in order political. to, we should definitely release a cover album. With this song, uh huh. Imagine hard the, rock version. Well, I think that was like death metal, death metal version. <laughs> I used what Freddie Lim taught me. Oh, well, there you go. You can uh, maybe convince Denise Ho and Freddie Lim to let you join them on stage. Oh my gosh, with my coy, that's that is now my dream. <laughs> so, my less interesting point was about how sometimes Western companies, in an effort to avoid politics have to make a political decision which is like do we reframe something the way the communist party wants or do we stand up for what is more truthful or accurate uh and then face major political consequences which is basically what so many airlines have done by changing taiwan on their flight destinations to uh you know whether it's it's taipei or uh, you know Taiwan comma China, or whatever it is that they use to solve the that that problem. So it's kind of like, the, but they're put in a difficult position, which I understand. But the problem is that they're all giving into this. Yeah, but the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, come I know. on. Well, they're probably getting all their books printed in China. So I, I think also there's that whole thing about um, y- you know there are. Tiananmen Square conspiracy theories led by the Chinese Communist Party, where I think I stumbled upon this last week where I was looking up something about Tiananmen Square and found this socialist newspaper that had an article from a few years ago where they were debunking the Tiananmen Square so-called massacre, Mm. where it basically took the whole, oh, you know... um, there was never tanks that went in like that was all faked and it was really students that who lynched these unarmed soldiers like that whole right and then there's the other side of that which is that you showed me that um thing that showed how how state after the the tank man video and photos came out state run media tried to flip that by saying Look at how much restraint our soldiers showed. And this video proves it, that our soldiers exercised restraint. Yes, because, look, we didn't run over this one guy. 
Yeah. I mean, I think also... Uh, ignore Fang Jun. Yeah. Well, I think also Tank Man gets misinterpreted sometimes because it's a very powerful image, but the context is that it happened on June 5th, mm-hmm. not June 4th. So, After most of the so killing. So the tanks were actually rolling out of the square where they had already... Rolled over. over. They, they were done massacring people, you know. Yeah. Which, like, from a certain point of view, makes that guy all the braver because, like, this is not like I'm going to challenge you. It's like, oh, I've already seen these tanks crush lots of people. But let I'm, me just, let yeah, me just, I'm just going to yeah. stand in front. Yeah. So that that does make his act much better. And if you've seen the kind of like zoomed out version, because there was a, mm-hmm. one famous photo that always gets used. But there have been other photos that show, like, it's not just, like, three tanks. It's, like, 20 tanks. Yeah, it's, like, a highway full of tanks. Uh, so, yeah, it does make his individual thing braver. But at the same time, it can be easily misinterpreted as, well, like, they didn't run him over or, you know. Yeah. I guess. Um, actually, it's interesting because Tiananmen, uh, the Tiananmen Square Massacre happened because there was, uh, for a month protests in Tiananmen and actually around the country but the biggest was in uh, Beijing of you know people calling for uh, reforms uh, in China they were not calling for an end to the Communist Party which is sometimes uh, I think yeah sometimes it gets a little confused because people remember that like or like generally kind of know that they were calling for democracy but it was more like political reform they wanted rule of law yeah and they wanted uh, transparency for the um, finances of top officials as, as a way to, to keep corruption at bay. And those, I mean, those are the two main things. There were other things they wanted to. But yeah, again, nobody was calling for an end to the CCP, which, you know, of course, now in 2019, there are a lot of uh, dissidents and activists who are saying, you know, look, we've tried for so long and the Communist Party has not reformed and you know if you look at the surveillance that they're using or what they're doing in Xinjiang or what they're doing to Falun Gong still uh, these are just like you're never gonna be able to fix these issues with the CCP in power and so like I was I was in an Uber uh, last week and the driver was Chinese and I was chatting with him and uh, you know, I asked, I was like, why did you come to the United States? And he's like, oh, the clean air, clean food, clean water. Uh, and we're, we're kind of joking around. And, and uh, you know, I asked him what he thought of, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And he's like, oh, nobody likes the Chinese Communist Party anymore. Well, he you can know, say like that a, because he's in America. <laughs> yeah. He's just like the, the Lao Bai Sing uh like they don't the the common people they don't like the party they think it's really corrupt um and so i just even five years ago like you just wouldn't have overseas chinese people even daring to say that but well i don't know if that's true i i think that that gradually the i mean i've heard that people inside China china have been saying that for years now okay so maybe it's been longer than i think but but 30 years ago, there was not a movement, a large movement to end the Communist Party. And I think that is gradually changing. There is just more and more people who are willing to say, the whole thing needs to go. Anyways, the point I was kind of getting at is uh, these Tiananmen Square protests were one of the things brought up at the Oslo Freedom Forum as an example of a movement that failed. Yes. Um... And it was interesting to to look at it from that angle. And the umbrella movement also was brought up, like yes, you said. So, which is very sad. But, like, you know, if you look at them as, you know, ways to learn from failures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I think I have mixed feelings about what re- usually happens around these anniversaries. Like, the 25th anniversary of the tw- Tiananmen Square Massacre. Or the, this year's the 30th anniversary. That they'll be, like, suddenly for a week... Or so there'll be a lot of attention paid to it in the news, mm-hmm. like there'll be like articles written by people who were there, or opinion pieces about why it's important. And I've read some or episodes on China uncensored. uncensored. You know, like I've read some great ones, like Perry Link, uh, famous China scholar, mm-hmm. uh, wrote one about the Tiananmen Square massacre, and it was 
very moving and he like made a great case for why it needs to be called the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Mm. Um, so that one was definitely worth a read. And there was an interesting New York Times article by Chris Buckley who talked about this woman, her name is Jiang Ling, who she was a military reporter um, during the Tiananmen Square protests. And so she kind of had some firsthand knowledge and had seen documentation that showed that the revolt of the military against the orders sent down by Deng Xiaoping and the Central Military Commission when they told them to go in and crush the students was much more than had previously been known. And she had the kind of... The military did not want to no, they, crush the or students. like a lot of the military leaders did not want to and they tried to get out of it all sorts of different ways. And uh, that like they had even like thought about like publishing a letter in response uh, in the People's Daily about how um, they didn't think it was a good idea to uh, for the martial law to go in. Uh, and um, like the People's Daily at the time was ignoring the uh, propaganda ban to not, you know, publish stories about the protests. There were some so, critical of the government. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more press freedom in the 80s than there is now. Yeah, definitely. But like there was this moment where the military didn't want to do it. it was kind like, of on the yeah, side of the Yeah, and the propaganda department didn't want it. Like, so I think this is what they were talking about in the Why Movements Fail thing, where like there was this strategic moment that the, the students could have somehow, you know, gotten the military on their side, and then like that passed, yeah. and then they lost the offensive, basically. Yeah, I, th- I think what it was specifically was like there was a period where there could be some negotiation, and... The protesters would have had to give up some of what they wanted, um, but they didn't want to do that. So, you know, and that, that kind of example of like, you know, when you are organizing, when you're trying to affect regime change, you do need to be willing to, uh, you can't get everything necessary. It's like any kind of deal or negotiation where you have to sometimes. Well, not necessarily that they were thinking about regime change in that way at that time. True. Um, but as a lesson for future yeah be willing to negotiate yeah and so it was it was interesting to kind of like take a look back at these things where like now like people and this woman had like sat on the story for 30 years and then she decided to leave china and then she was finally going to say it uh and it was published in the new york times but like there will be this kind of you know light and attention on this for a week Mm -hmm. and then we'll go back to like just the way things are and new investment opportunities in China. Yeah. Although I think I think the situation's changing a little bit, but mm-hmm. like in terms of like these these anniversaries of these human rights violations that like there's a little bit of attention, we kind of look back. Uh you get maybe some updates on where what happened to people now like you know the Tiananmen mothers are still being put under house arrest every year around this time or but um, then, like, you know, the attention is going to go elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And I think all this raises a, an interesting question about, like, what does the future of China hold? And that was something that definitely came up over the Oslo Freedom Forum. Like, uh, well, we were specifically talking to Yang Jin Li, who, uh, Li, as I mentioned earlier, he was, he was there during the Tiananmen protests. And then he was later, um, went back to China. He was basically, after the Tiananmen protests, he left and was banned from going back. Um, and then he went back in 2002 um, to try to help like this labor movement that was happening and then was in prison for five years. Uh, yeah. But he's, he's the head of the Citizen Power Initiatives and he's like a, a Washington, D.C.-based Chinese activist mm-hmm. who's, you know, really trying to... Uh, Organize and kind of bring different groups together uh, to to you know stand up against the authoritarianism in China. Well, I was joking about how it's kind of like the the, the Chinese Avengers in a certain way because like he's interested in bringing together all of the um, you know 
dissident groups, whether it's like <laughs> the Christians and Falun Gong and the Uyghurs and, and the Tibetans democracy, yeah. and democracy activists, like all these different disparate groups to kind of try to, and that's one thing that's pretty hard for, I think, dissidents to do is to like work together because everybody has their own kind of cause, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But there is a commonality to it and uh, it takes, it takes real leadership to do that. Uh, but I, you know, the next step I think uh, is to start to really paint a picture of a future in China without the CCP because there's been so much brainwashing over the last 70 years in China of like, oh, you know, the Communist Party is your mother. Or there's, you know, there is no new China without the Chinese Communist Party. It's a catchy song. And it is a catchy song. And this, this power of songs, you know, that song, imagine, you start to believe in... You start to imagine. You yeah. start to imagine that what's in the song is just how it is. Right, the Communist Party is your mother? That's, that's how it goes. There's a, there's a song, <laughs> no, not that one. No, there's a song that has that as a, as a lyric. So, so, I mean, since we're talking about Star Wars, I'm just imagining the scene where Xi Jinping is like, Dissident, I am your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then he cuts off their hand. <laughs> Does that happen before? He, he the hand gets cut off first. Oh, that's true. Yes. Yes. And uh, but it's the pain of of hearing about his father that's more painful. Yeah. Than, yeah. No, that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your Luke Skywalker impression? <laughs> yeah, that's my whiny Mark Hamill. Okay. <laughs> Um, so is that Mark Hamill as the Joker or no? That was Luke Skywalker, not okay. Joker. Mark Hamill. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think the time has come that that people need to start painting a picture of what a China could look like without the Chinese Communist Party and kind of break through uh, the brainwashing of the only China is a China under the Communist Party. But you know, if you just look at that objectively, that is historically untrue. Because historically, over the last, you know, they say 5,000 years of continuous civilization. But at least among the, the documented dynasties over the last two and a half thousand years, like clearly there have been many dynasties. Before uh, the Communist Party? Before the Communist Party. But wait, I thought the Communist Party belonged to China since ancient times. <laughs> No, China has belonged to the Communist Party since. Oh, okay, that yes. Way. Yeah, but I don't know if you can say five thousand years of continuous civilizations. I mean, the Qing Dynasty with those Manchu barbarians. Can, you can call well, that. Well, well, we, you know, sometimes people talk about, oh, the Manchus were foreigners, but but the Communist Party, like based on Marxism and Leninism, like that and, is a very foreign thing to be ruling China. Well, you know. It's a like it's it's the most absurd claim that the Communist Party is like a Chinese thing. I mean, even Buddhism had a hard time making it in China at the beginning because oh, it was yeah. a foreign religion. Yeah, yeah. No, the Communist Party is is a is a foreign cult that has <laughs> that has taken over. It's very propagandistic China. when yeah. you say it like that. I mean, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm... but there there are like a Communist Party is kind of like an evil cult. Like, if you think about it, they, they force you to believe their thing. Uh, they take your money. If you don't believe in their thing, they will punish you. Uh, they they make it very difficult for people to leave. Right? Like, I mean, in a lot of ways, it is very much like a cult. Sounds like my ex-wife. <laughs> Maven. <laughs> take my wife. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know why you love this kind of like vaudeville comedy hey, so much. Just, Chris was perfect. born in the wrong time. Yeah. Uh, I do think uh, now that Chris and I have stopped stepping all over your point. Uh, yeah. Stop interrupting me, Sean. Uh -huh, that uh, it is interesting because we did have that conversation with Yang Jinli about the future of China and. What struck me is that I have so rarely had that conversation with people. And even for me, focusing on China for so long, but kind of being in the weeds of it and reporting about what's happening in China now, or like, you just don't really think about what's going to happen in a certain way. What's going to happen next? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely talk of like, you know, the Communist Party collapsing. That's been had, like, even the Communist Party has been talking about the Communist Party collapsing. Well, they've been talking about why the Soviet Union was wrong. And yeah. They're never going to be like the Soviet Union. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, like, Hu Jintao, like, 
in 2011 was like corruption is such a serious issue it could bring the collapse of the communist party what did he know oh, maybe more than anyone suspects um but i think it is interesting because a lot of the other issues that came up during the oslo freedom forum like you know countries like in venezuela or nicaragua or where or cameroon or whatever where there are kind of more large-scale nonviolent protests mm -hmm. going on that's not happening in china yeah so in a sense it makes the future of china uh like a ccp less future of china feel very far away yeah like what would come next is it going to be democracy is it going to be something else or like is what's it, xinjiang going to do like what is it even worth like there's no it looks like it's getting worse and worse uh, the surveillance, the monitoring, the clampdown on civil society, like what hope is there for any kind of nonviolent protest? You know, these things, it just feels like, oh, well, it's, it's far away from any of that. Yeah, I mean, the Communist Party is not just quashing dissent, but they want to create a society where there is no dissent in the first place. Yes, um, like the whole, um, you know, security thing or like that, Security means the absence of threat. Imagine all the people living in harmony. I don't... Yeah, like, like in Xinjiang. They're all living harmoniously in, in re-education camps. Well, they're also being bred out of existence. Yeah, and, and you know, the, without getting too much into the Xinjiang thing, uh, like, if you look at the future of China, there is this idea that I think is being propagated by the Communist Party, which is, if there is no Communist Party, a Chinese society will be total chaos. And uh, that doesn't necessarily follow. And then I'm not a, a, a scholar of, you know, the Chinese government and how that's structured. But if the idea that, that chaos and violence is a necessary uh, or is an automatic result of getting rid of the CCP like that in itself is propaganda that's meant to make people think oh well maybe I don't like the Chinese Communist Party but it would be worse without them yeah like the better the devil you know right yeah but I mean that's that's not necessarily how it plays out in countries after there's regime change and so you know, we should be open-minded about the possibilities of this. And it's obviously not for someone like me to figure out what the future of China is going to be. It's for China. Yeah, it's for China, for the people of China. Actually, uh, Zhou Feng Suo had a really interesting phrase um, in the interview you did with him, Chris, where he talked about um, China's fight against communism. And mm. when he used the word China, he meant... Uh, something different than what a lot of people mean. It's like he, I guess, meant the Chinese people, or the spirit of China, the country of China, fighting up, you know, fighting against getting rid of the sort of foreign uh, specter of communism that has come in and, and taken over. You know, China's fight against communism could be a good title for this podcast. I think so. <laughs> I thought you were going to say for a book. Or a song. <laughs> China's fight against communism. <laughs> That's more like a 70s style protest song. That maybe this, is, this is Imagine. Oh, okay. Okay, oh, Matt's okay. giving me the wrap it up sign. I was going to sing this version of Imagine. No, we don't have time for that. We don't have time All for that. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I just said that, Matt. Thanks for listening. Oh, that sounded a little passive aggressive. No, it was actively aggressive. What was <laughs> what was unclear about that? <laughs> oh. Uh, oh boy, we've been in Oslo too long. I mean, yes, I think we need some sleep. <laughs> yeah, and barbecue. Uh, anyway. um, so yeah, thank you for listening. If you if, if you haven't been thanked enough for listening, let me thank you for listening again. And our next podcast, just as a reminder. Oh, yeah. Uh, our next podcast is going to be with BBC dad himself, uh, Robert Kelly, about uh, North and South Korea and China. And it's fascinating and a lot more on topic than this one. 
This it is was, somewhat more on topic. Yeah. yeah. China's this was on topic. China's fight against communism. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, you... Thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to say your name and then sign out. Yeah, I know. I'm giving you two the opportunity to also thank our wonderful audience. Can we really oh listening. ever thank our audience enough? That's a good point. We can't. Really? I mean, just meeting the fans at the the at the fan meetup. Yeah. Yeah, we had like 30 people at the Oslo fan meetup, which, as you pointed out. Uh, was the most fans per capita uh, based on the, the population size of the country we're visiting. I'm pretty sure that was you that pointed that out, Matt. I don't even remember who pointed that out. <laughs> but at any rate, um, yeah, so it was great to meet all the fans. And for everyone listening, thank you for listening. Yes, thank you for listening. Thank you. They were all very sweet and polite. The, uh, and tall. Fans. They, they, uh, so tall. Yeah, but so polite that it almost seemed like they were too polite to ask questions, which I feel like is a, is a first. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But, I mean, yeah, was, I, I thank them for coming almost as much as I thank you for listening. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, Matt's giving me the wrap it up, so. I was going to, you know compliment our audience a little bit more but oh please no no please Shelly oh well I was just gonna say um one one of the fans came up and you know was shaking my hand and told me that you know we're fighting the good fight and you know touching people's hearts and that was really really nice to hear it um, is nice to hear that and uh, he was even like when you feel down think about that I was like you people are too nice yeah wow that is that is that's very nice Oh. So, so we can think about that. Okay. Wow. Now I'm coming from a different place when I say, "Thank you for listening." Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. <laughs> I'm Shelley John. And I'm Matt Ganesha. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>